Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Trade the Chain. Thank you for joining us. It is October second, and um, it, it's going to be it's going to be a great episode. We got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, we're going to hit the big board, see what the Bitcoin action was, the Ethereum action was for the week. Uh, there was uh, some movement, so uh, the volatility is um, has been in there. Uh, then we're going to go to our hot or not list, and we got some good ones on this list. Uh, we have Theta, which has uh, become really popular. Um, I know, uh, I know, Rob from Digital Asset News here, uh, who's joined us today. He's he's big into Theta, um, as well as yes. XMR. <laughs> well, I, I think, and, and just to pause for a sec, I think you're they're doing video stuff you're working with, right? Theta. Yeah. Oh yeah, Theta is going to be. It's, it's going to be one of those big ones that's going to really solve a, a big problem. Streaming right. services and high def. So when we hit the charts on Theta, we're going to definitely want to get Rob's uh, real world use input on that as well. Uh, after Theta, it's going to be XMR, Monero. Um, and then heading over to the not list, we got YFII. It's DFI money. I'm not too familiar with it. Uh, we're going to let our uh, analysts, uh, both CJ and Monty, who joined us here today from Chicago, uh, alongside my co-host Ryan Gorman, uh, spending his last few weeks in New York before he moves on to the big blue yonder, and then uh, and best Aaron crypto, and then of course we have Rob from Digital Asset News joining us from Texas. And thank you everybody. But first, we're going to start off with the news of the week. I really don't even have to intro it because everybody has to know what it is. But it's Bitmex getting wrecked themselves. Uh, you know, executive management charged with multiple counts by both the CFTC and the DOJ, that's civil and criminal. Um, so we're going to run right into that. Ryan, what do we got going on? Yeah, so uh, yesterday the news dropped and it was, it was surprising. BitMEX being as uh, big and established of a, an exchange as they are, but at, at the same time, I mean, when you have Arthur Hayes, who was literally openly daring, regulators to come after him. I mean, it was only a matter of time, at least for the CFTC, but I think the DOJ charges were quite a surprise, as was, uh, you know, one of his co-founders uh, uh, being arrested at his home in Massachusetts and taken into custody. I mean, that leaves uh, Arthur Hayes kind of like the last man standing, basically. It, uh, I wonder if he, uh, if he leaves Hong Kong to face these charges. Um, I mean, this is such a big story that it ended up, uh, you know, in the New York Times. The New York Times doesn't cover crypto all that much, but for them to do so shows the, uh, uh, the, 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 the importance of what's, what's happening. And it, it had quite the impact on the markets. Um, but just from a news perspective, Rob, how are you looking at this? So at first, like this was, this was all, all a wash in the Twitterverse. And I was pretty, I, I was thinking about it. And I go, this could be a big major thing. It could be like a big major dip. And we're going to see a lot of price action. But, uh, you know, if this would have happened in 2017, I think it would have seen, I mean, huge, massive dips. Absolutely. But, I mean, I mean, what do we see? I mean, what do we see right now? We, I mean, we have this issue that, that, that came about with BitMEX, and then this was reported on yesterday. So when I did my video yesterday, it had dropped a whopping 1%. 1% when, I mean, this huge exchange goes down and is, going, is being accused of uh, violating Anti-Money Laundering Act. Yeah. And also because they had set up, set up an, an exchange when they should not have even done anything like that. So when I looked at this, I'm like, this is going to be big. And of course, I was wrong because it only dropped 1%. So I started to think to myself, maybe this is actually a positive sign for cryptocurrency, digital assets, because look at the strength and resiliency of what is going on. Now, here we are today. It is Friday. What is it? The 3rd, October, something like that. Uh, and then, of course, what happened with Donald Trump? Uh, contracting the uh, coronavirus, and then we saw the different things that happened in the traditional markets already. They're already taking a tumble. So I think you have like a double whammy going on. Um, I'm surprised it's not even worse, but it isn't. I mean, uh, when you I'll have pays on, on like quoted in the indictment saying that it's easier to bribe the authorities in Seychelles than anywhere else because you can basically hand them just a coconut. <laughs> I mean, you have, what is it, setting up a securities exchange without a license, you have bank fraud, wire fraud, securities fraud, you have all these charges coming both from the CFTC and the DOJ. I mean, you would think that these guys are in a lot of trouble, especially with what, that pre-dawn raid in Massachusetts? But if what I've read is true, he only faces five years in prison and he's got, what, I've, I've seen some reports where he was reported to have earned, what, $3.6 billion? If for five years of prison, I get to keep my money and pay maybe a billion dollar fine, I, I, it doesn't seem like there's much motivation to not do this again. 
I right? saw the fine was two hundred fifty exactly. thousand. Yeah, turn a fine of a quarter million dollars. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you do this if you're someone else? You see Arthur Hayes gets a slap on the wrist. You're just like, okay, I'm going. I'm going to set up an exchange and hand the Seychelles authorities a bunch of coconuts. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, but look, I mean, look, look what happens with the entire banking sector. I mean, look what's happened with J.P. Morgan yeah. and HSBC. They're like, oh, well, yeah, we did do some laundering. Our bad. Uh, so how much are you going to fine us? <laughs> we don't care. We just made two trillion. So we don't really care. And, and just go right ahead because it's going to be the same thing over and over again. And I was talking about this and people are like, well, do you think they're going to get busted? I'm like, no, the <laughs> bankers. Do you, did, didn't you see what happened in 2008? Do you see any bankers in jail? It's the same no. thing, just going round and round. That was the, that's the thing, right? And Bitcoin Magazine put out a tweet yesterday that really made, some, made the rounds talking about how no one in traditional finance was arrested for anything that happened during the Great Recession, but Arthur Hayes is, going, is likely going to jail. And like, it was just kind of like a, hmm, seems like there's a bit of bias there. But, uh, you know, it's, 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 as you said, though, it's a good thing for uh, crypto, I think, overall, because if you start to clean up the market and you have more legitimate exchanges, not that BitMEX wasn't a legitimate exchange in the eyes of many, but if you have ones that are regulated and you have investor protections there, I think overall, it's a good look for the industry. And, and, and we kind of now know what you can and can't do with a derivatives exchange for, for crypto. So, I mean, it makes it a barrier to entry, I guess, a little bit more for institutions and they can start looking at it more seriously, which is what we all... Hopefully, want I guess I think right yeah. Well, it's tightening down the rule book, and um, again, you're not going to get that institutional adoption until you tighten down the rule book. And you know, I know I know name brand crypto institutions that use Bitmex, um, and so it is that counterparty exposure uh, that you put on your books when uh, they're not following the rules. I will say um, that you know to have your picture in the technology section of the New York Times is one of the most coveted things in the <laughs> world, okay? If you are Mark Zuckerberg and it's you're starting out in 2004 with Facebook, you're, you're dying for the day your picture's there. For Arthur Hayes, not so good. No, no, you don't want, because uh, you don't want your picture on the Times over infamy. Like that's, 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 that's not good, not good for him. That's true. <laughs> so I have a question for you guys and like, as traders, this hits home very personal because where am I going to go now to blow myself out with 100x level? Like, <laughs> how could the CFTC do this? It's it's wrong. You're such a selfish, selfish person, CJ. I, listen, but, they were losing market share. They were losing market share for months now. And, and yeah. you have plenty of exchanges that will go up 100x in leverage. I'm not going to give them any free advertising and name them, but there are handfuls at this point, at least two and um, uh, handfuls, not just two exchanges. But uh, yeah, the, the business model was, was copied and repeated. And, um, you know, just over the last two months, I believe BitMEX lost about 30% of uh of its option share in the market alone so um th they were starting to take a little bit of a hit the void will be filled i mean someone will always step in and fill a need if it's there yeah Gee, and you're less... not in the seychelles are you <laughs> <laughs> no no <laughs> yeah, we'll see right. we'll see well, I mean, listen, the, the uh, you know, that that announcement did affect the markets uh, a little bit uh, during the course of the week um, and uh, the impending demise of BitMEX, which I'm sure uh, is a foregone conclusion, um, is sad to some like CJ, but the big boards, uh, Monty and CJ, how did how did BTC and uh, Ethereum take the news on this? Yeah, I think I think uh, Rob made a great point with like saying that this kind of really speaks to the maturity of the crypto space. Cause like he said, if this would have happened in 2017, I think this would have been much more significant in terms of the price action that followed. When I heard about this, honestly, my stomach kind of dropped cause I got, I got nervous. I panic sold. I was like, this is not good, but really like it wasn't as much of an effect as I thought. And with the confluence of all the other news going on with all the political ambiguity and the, the debate and Trump getting COVID, I think, um, I, I was really expecting a much steeper drop. So I think uh, the fact that Bitcoin was kind of able to catch that moving average and find some support and stabilization, I think it's still, I think it's still going to drop. Um, I think it may retest that next moving average, but I think for the most part, um, this was a, was like a, a good bullish indication for the maturity of the crypto space. 
Absolutely. I mean, I, this, this would have been a significant drop, probably 20% or more if it happened a few years ago. This is, um, I mean, the shocks that we had back then over relatively minor events compared to BitMEX being raided by the feds and possibly being shut down. I mean, it's, it's remarkable how resilient the market is these days. Do you think that's just because there are more participants and there's more liquidity? So there's a bit more of a diverse point of view in the market and that's why? Yeah, there's definitely a more diverse point of view. And I think also there is more legitimacy. So like, I think if this would have happened in 2017, a lot of people would have actually questioned the legitimacy of cryptocurrency, the long-term legitimacy of it. Um, but I think with this happening, happening now, it's kind of just people understand that it max is just going to go down and another one's going to pop up. I mean, even with the, with like the very uh, minuscule uh, punishment that's handed out to BitMEX, I think that kind of even strengthens the people's conviction that this doesn't change much of anything at all. Well, it, it's interesting to see, uh, you know, I'm looking at the chart and uh, it's interesting to see two event news event driven dips in the market, right? One happening on uh, uh, Thursday with BitMEX, we had uh, that sharp decline. And then exactly just a little after midnight with, uh, with the President Trump COVID news coming out, we had the uh, we had another dip, so it, it's definitely a, a news-driven market right now. But I think you know, to to, to your guys' point, it, it's just not a sensitive market like it it, it was a couple of years ago. Um, so yeah, I mean, doing a little better. But what do we got for technical, CJ? Yeah, so uh, we talked about the traditional markets, or you mentioned them just briefly, and how Trump uh, getting coronavirus did scare the market a lot. However, we did have a warning in the technicals yesterday when we had both the S&P and the Dow. Here, let me pull up the Dow real quick. Anyways, they both topped on this nine on the four hour. And obviously that correlated into Bitcoin as well. Now we're seeing a very resilient market in the equity market as well, uh, bouncing off this moving average. And that's kind of carried into Bitcoin as well in the sense that we're bouncing off that same moving average. Um, at this point, I wouldn't necessarily be long. I don't think I'd be short either just because we're really testing these support levels. But what makes me nervous is that each time you test a, a moving average or a resistance or support level like this, theoretically, each additional time that you test it, it becomes weaker. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we've tested it three times and have created this higher lows makes me a little bit nervous, especially when we reach a red two closing below the previous red one on sequential. That's just not what you want to see from an objective bullish perspective. So. Mm. Very cool. Um, Ethereum, how's the role on Ethereum doing? I see, you know, listen, it, it had the correlation with the, uh, with the news events as well. Um, DeFi is, is still pumping. Uh, we've had projects lost, but we've had new projects come on. Uh, I believe there was a project I saw that just collected 68 million in, uh, in value locked in its first 24 hours. I mean, ridiculous. I can't wait uh, to launch Edamame coin. Um, but, you know, what's the outlook on Ethereum? Yeah, right now it's very, very similar to Bitcoin. Like you pointed out, um, this was a very news driven week and Ethereum and Bitcoin were really affected in a lot of the same ways with the news. Um, uh, the, uh, for I think Ethereum was less affected by the BitMEX news just because they see less volume on BitMEX than Bitcoin does, but they, they still were certainly affected. And like we talked about, um, it kind of just shook the whole space. So I think all coins and tokens were kind of shook, but yeah, I think, um, I think right now with this news driven market, we're going to see a strong correlation between Bitcoin and Ethereum. And yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Ethereum like Bitcoin retested that moving average uh, below it and maybe even broke through it eventually. Okay. All and, right. and speaking to your, uh, your mentioning, mentioning of correlation, like we always talk about the correlation between Bitcoin and uh, the equity market. And the interesting thing is that while we've been following this correlation pretty tightly, uh, Willy Wu, one of our favorite analysts, um, met him one time at uh, Tone Vase's conference, but he published this really interesting graph that I think is important to pay attention to because this is about fundamental analysis, not just 
necessarily technical analysis. But if you look, we actually have more Bitcoin users now than we did in the peak of 2017. So um, this may lead some to believe in a particular decoupling between the S&P and Bitcoin. Um, obviously, we're not seeing it yet reflected in price action, but due to this number of active users and these fundamentals that we're seeing, it's pretty interesting and at least noteworthy in my, in my thoughts. Uh, you know, Willie, Willie, uh, we met him at the same conference. Uh, Willie's the one with the cowboy hat, right? Oh, no, that's Jimmy. That's yep. Jimmy. Jimmy's Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop that right there. So, um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, I, I always find it interesting when people talk about new wallets opening up, new users coming on board. Um, yet, of course, you know, price is still kind of uh, staying sideways or, or in the neighborhood. What really direct correlation do new wallets being opened up or new users coming into the market have to do with uh, price dependency at all? The fundamental idea is that, um, and, and this is kind of Willie's uh, argument, is that there's two kinds of, of traders in this market. Um, and actually, let me pull up the quotes because uh, I think he says it pretty well. So short-term moves are controlled by derivatives traders. So expect more whipsaw going forward, but it has nothing to do with the longer term macro, which is born from fundamental long-term supply and demand. And at a certain point, you're going to get a hodler investor squeeze that teleports price upward to a new correlative nature. And so, like I said, this is a double headed market. On one side, you have the startup investor VCs who are acting as the hodlers. And then you have the high, high net worth family office types and Wall Street operators. And so what he proposes is that he thinks the former being the hodlers will force this decoupling because the more active users you have, ultimately like that hodl cell wall keeps going up gradually throughout time. So, Sorry, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, that speaks to that diversity of uh, opinion in the user base because before everyone was just riding the uh, the hype wagon upwards back in the what in, in 17 whereas now you just have so many more people in and they're using it for so many different reasons that it makes sense that you'd have such better support uh, in times of stress when people know it's a short-term shock versus oh my god it's coming to an end like it appears look everyone jumped ship like like rats off a sinking ship back in uh, in 18 the first half of 18 whereas that didn't really happen because of BitMEX, so. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very positive sign. And I think when we see something like, like what um, Wu is, like Willie Wu is talking about here, um, at first I'm like, well, I look at active users and wallets, I mean, because you can have one person with multiple wallets, or you can have uh, entities with, with hundreds of wallets if you really wanted to. Well, th this but, one is actually filtered for unique addresses, specifically. Okay. Um, so that, yeah, you're right, CJ. So, I mean, that, 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 that is definitely one part. But there is this, this other part where he talks about, and I agree with him, the more that holders come in and they hold and you have a supply and demand and you have all these people who are on the sidelines going, I'm not selling. And then you have this price action which go, well, if you're not going to sell, there's a ton of demand. I, I, I have only one way to go. And I think it's, it's the same thing of when people ask me, well, uh, what about these whales? Because they, they manipulate the market. Well, they can do that now because they have the control. But at some point, the traders and the whales, at some point, they're going to dump or they're going to sell. And that goes into whose hands? That goes into the hands of people who actually believe in Bitcoin, believe in cryptocurrency, believe in digital assets, and they will hold on for the long haul. And it's, it just goes to show you like how the market has progressed and these big, huge players like a Michael Saylor from MicroStrategy, for like a Paul Tudor Jones, like all these people get into it and like, you know what, if they're into it, I can see the legitimacy. I'm going to hold on for the long haul, 5, 10, 15 years. I mean, selfishly to that point, I was, I was kind of hoping Bitcoin would go down a little bit more yesterday so I could buy and have been, you know, reset. I, I, no, 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 man. I, I hear you. And that, that's, that's, that's the beauty of people not like us, not FOMOing in all the time and going, I'm going to dump all my money in. If you have money on the sidelines and don't FOMO in and don't get screwed out on uh, like a place like BitMEX where you get, you know, 50, 100X, you lose all your money. You've got money on the sidelines to go, hey, this is a fantastic buying opportunity. Instead of feeling that tightness in your chest going, holy smokes, I just lost 10% of my net worth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It, it's, you know, also the people have to realize out there that, you know, there's uh, the long-term 
to what uh, CJ was saying about hodlers and taking up supply so that uh, there's more demand. And there's also short-term profit takers that are uh, using the volatility, right? So even if you have hodlers uh, taking up, let's call I think the percentage was, it, it was, um, uh, I, there was just a little more uh, of hodlers than there were liquid trading uh, Bitcoin in the marketplace, which was surprising. But it doesn't matter how small that liquid trading part of the market becomes because the volatility has the same effect. You'll, once, once there's sell orders going into the market, there'll be price drops. When there's buying, there'll be price rising and so forth and so on. It'll just be on a smaller scale. And then, of course, there'll be, if there's any hodlers doing massive dumps, uh, that'll pr price that'll drive price action as well. So um, it, it's a it's it's a business that keeps you on your toes all the time. Um, <laughs> moving on to our hot list, uh, Theta. Now um, Theta has been up and coming pretty well uh, over the last couple of months, and one of the reasons I'm excited that we do have Rob on the show today is because he actually participates, uses Theta in real world. So, um, you know, I wanted to kind of get his opinion and, and what the project's all about, because I think he knows the most right now. And then after that, we'll go into the greedy technicals of us uh, people who, want, who are capital market guys. <laughs> the greedy technicals, classic. <laughs> So actually, the one who knows the most about this is actually uh, Digital Dave over at Crazy for Cryptos. Check out his channel. He's, got, he's the one that actually introduced me to Theta. He's the one that knows the most about it. But when I got into Theta, the whole big thing is, and, and this, this goes back to uh, allocation of resources, right? So there's, there's only so much that for, for data processing centers to actually have the, the servers to whip out or to be able to uh, stream 4K, high definition uh, type of streams. So what Theta is going to do is in the background, they're gonna allow that sharing across all the different computers, all the different nodes out there. And then the people that actually watch these videos are going to be paid in this thing called T-Fuel. So Theta is the network, Theta is the governance token, and then you have T-Fuel and that's what everybody earns. So one of the big problems right now is that, and I think we were just talking about this earlier, is about streaming high definition. Like how many, how many data centers do you actually need? How many servers do you actually need to actually make this happen? We need a boatload, we need a lot of money to actually make this work, look at YouTube. So if you don't have to have that, and you can use the untapped resources that are in all the different computers and nodes out there, well then you, you get yourself a winner. And I think with this one, we actually did a, uh, a review of Theta. We took a look at the white paper, the use cases is there. But one of the big things that I saw was that, and I know we're going to be uploading this to YouTube, but there's, YouTube's got its problems and YouTube has its glitches. And uh, with Theta, those things kind of go away, especially with being able to pay creators, being able to use T Fuel to give out money to other people as far as like tips and things like that. And I think it could be an actually big thing on top of the fact that one of the uh, advisors is Steve Chen, who's the co-founder of YouTube and they've got uh, pretty great backing. So I think it's going to be a big deal. Not only that, but one of the validators or guardian nodes is actually Google. So, so are you paying, you're paying the creators directly for their content or are you paying for the bandwidth to so view the with, HD or 4K content? Exactly. So good question. So like every time, and I actually put out a tweet during the presidential debates. I don't know if you saw those. Fantastic, really nice, uh, easy uh, discussion that went on along there. So for the presidential debates, I said, hey, watch this on Theta with me. So as you were watching Theta, or actually as you were actually using Theta and you're watching these types of things, Theta is able to actually use your type of resources and they're gonna pay you in T Fuel. So you actually have T Fuel. And then once you go around and actually watch other type of creators, you can kind of give those to the other creators. So it's kind of like they're using the allocation of resources, but you're able to actually pay out in this, in this T-Fuel. Now, the problem was, what I saw, was that there was a couple of hiccups uh, during that presidential debate. I mean, there was a lot of people that were watching this. So I think it's, it could be there, but it's just not there yet. It's just like Ethereum, Ethereum 2.0, DeFi. It could be there, it's just not there yet. Okay. 
And CJ and Monty, anything on the tacticals with this? I mean, what are we looking at? Where has it been? And what are uh, short-term um, uh, outlook for it? Sorry, I was just sharing No, oh, and there, <laughs> <laughs> that is quite the chart, CJ. All right, all right, back to. Uh, back to <laughs> um, that was true. That's like a presentation, though, of the debate itself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, but discussing the technicals, uh, it was really cool talking about this one last week because I love watching an asset that's just continually making new highs and people are like, I can't buy it now. It's, it's, it keeps going up. Well, you know, sometimes uh, what seems irrationally high continues to go higher. And that's a perfect example of what we're seeing here. Um, last week, I liked it a lot because we had this green two on sequential that was telling you there's probably still some gas left in this this Lamborghini that's just been going up over the past few months. And so I like buying that breakout. And this is kind of a similar pattern with XMR that we'll show you in just a moment. But this green to breaking above the prior uh, candle swing high with bullish momentum creating brand new highs. I really like that long trade. And if you had an opportunity to see that last week, um, it would have been an ideal trade setup, at least in the way in which I view trades um, in this particular market. Now, unfortunately, it looks like we've topped temporarily on this green seven. We have a green two closing below the previous green one candle, or red one candle, excuse me. And uh, that's very similar to the sequential candles on Bitcoin and Ethereum right now. They're kind of bearish, and we're looking to retest uh, possibly this 53 cent level. Um, but really liking the fundamentals, especially how uh, Rob laid them down. That's really cool. Steve Chen actually went to my high school, so it's kind of a personal thing. Um, you, that's cool. There you go. Do you think this, uh, this uh, slightly bearish outlook, I guess, is tied just to a broader downturn in the markets that may be a little bit more prolonged than we initially thought because of what happened with BitMEX um, at all? Or is it just this is kind of overheated for a little while and um, people are profit taking? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's more probably the second one with profit taking. But when Bitcoin goes down and when you have massive movements, the money isn't necessarily uh, the money isn't necessarily to be made in like the individual price movements. I think it's easier to size up the collective market movements um, to be able to make money. And and what that means, what I'm trying to say is just it's a bull market, so I'm gonna trade with a bullish bias until the market tells me something otherwise. This is still uh, bullish, but I'm more looking for a chance to buy a dip. I don't see this as, like the BitMEX issue is very big, but I don't think it's throwing a complete wrench into this whole bull market. I think we still have plenty of more uh, of bullish price action. Okay. Very cool. Well. On to the next one, we got XMR, Monero, and this one, I mean, Monero is, is an interesting coin because um, one, it's not very easy to use for everybody as far as rules, regulations, and exchanges are concerned. Um, but what are we looking at this, CJ? Um, yeah, so this is a little bit like beta in the sense that we're creating new highs in this bull market and uh, like, in our service, we publish trade ideas and uh, XMR was just a bullish one um, earlier this week. And the reason why I did that was because we had this green three candle that was closing above the prior swing high on the nine, breaking into new highs. Um, so, you know, that gave you a pretty good opportunity to at least take some profit once we got through the 107 level. And then we were pretty much rejected, never really made it to 120. And then we came down really hard. Um, so at least if you were in that trade, hopefully you didn't lose any money and, and raised your stop to break even at the very least. Um, but yeah, I mean, I see this trend being somewhat exhausted. I think we need to cool down and retest some of these support levels and moving averages in order to create another uh, higher low and resume the bull trend. Because I mean, if you look at this thing uh, just since March, I mean, it's just, it's been trucking pretty well. And I'm interesting, I'm interested to hear from Rob and, and who else, everyone else just, you know, are there fundamental factors causing Monero being a, you know, the core privacy coin? 
the FBI tells us that they don't know or they can't track Monero. Maybe that's still true. Um, but well, I, want, I want to ask you is, is really what is the trading behind Monero, right? Because of its privacy um, uh, values, it, it's, <clears throat> it's a great way for anonymous uh, payments. It's a great way for anonymous holdings. Is it really an actively traded coin like Ethereum or XRP or, or any of the usuals that we, we deal with? Also, on top of that, what, what drove it down so much back in March? Like, was that just the broader sell-off in crypto markets as a whole? Because it, it was surging upward then, and then it recovered almost instantly. Like, it flash crashed down, and then it went right back up, almost to where it was from the flash crash within, like, a, a week or two. Yeah, I think those are some really interesting points. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that Monero is kind of a unique coin, and it is kind of like a darling of the crypto space and has been for a long time. And like you point out, Alex, it doesn't see nearly as much trade volume as Bitcoin or Ethereum does. But there are a lot of people that do believe in the fundamentals of this coin and the privacy that's associated with it. Um, but I mean, looking at the technicals of this chart, like you pointed out, Ryan, it really dipped um, with all the other coins back in March. But looking at the most recent dip and the most recent run up, um, for me, these technicals are very reassuring, the way it perfectly bounced off that moving average during the large dip, and then the way it smashed through 100 as a resistance level during that run up the last, during the last week. I mean, I think, um, I think that's a very bullish uh, indicator for Monero, and I think it's less to do with the trade volume that's driving it, and more so to do with just um, people kind of believing in the importance of the privacy of the coin and um, believing that Monero is a coin that's here to stay. So like increased adoption maybe is what's driving it upwards versus people speculating? Yeah, I think I think that has more to do with it. Okay. So, hey, real quick, um, I don't know who's controlling the uh, the chart there. Can you bring up just five days, last five days? CJ is the, is the chart controller, Rob, just for future reference. Got it. He drives the boat like Hooper and Jaws. <laughs> that's right, classic. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, do you have a preference on time frame? I've got the one hour right here. No, because the, the reason I talk about it, I was always under the assumption that privacy coins were going to die. They're going to die a slow death because they were be getting delisted. Not too long ago, I think it was Coinbase UK, they delisted, they delisted, I don't know if it was Zcash or Monero, one of those two. And then, of course, that also went along with two other uh, pretty large exchanges. So what happened two or three days ago, I forgot what it was, but Gemini, and this is, this is a great lesson as, as far as like, you know, what you're supposed to do as far as getting regulatory clar uh, clarity. They said, hey, we want to use Zcash and we want them to be able to use um, private transactions. And they did a long type of uh, process. And finally they said, yes. So as of, I think it was two or three days ago, it was on the blog post. They said, yes, if you buy, I mean, you can use uh, Zcash. And from here, from uh, the exchange, you can do fully private transactions. So, I mean, there, so there's a little, so when I saw that, I go, I was wrong yet again, uh, which is not surprising. So I'm like, okay, so privacy coins are actually going to, you know, move forward. The thing is though, is that we do these privacy coins. It's not like you can buy them anonymously. It's fiat to the exchange. Exchange gives you Zcash. Zcash, you can pay anybody you want to. And the amount, uh, what you, you know, of course, what you send and then the receiver, it's all private. And what was crazy about the whole thing was that the regulator said, yeah, we'll go with it. We'll, we're going to go with that. So here we are. Yeah, we, I mean, on a business note, I will say that um, we, uh, we over at BQuant, we just uh, took on a large uh, or decent sized institutional client um, who only was a client of Gemini. Um, and then came to us and added us as another counterparty because of the Monero fact. So they have two core uh, holdings they use, Bitcoin and Monero. Um, they're, a, uh, uh, they, they're a big uh, uh, taker of both of those. Um, and Gemini wasn't able to facilitate the Monero. So they came to us and, you know, if they, they buy from from us in 10, 20, $30 million tranches, just because it's the nature of what they want to do. They just want the privacy of the holdings. And so I, I find it interesting, you know, um, I know that there was some news 
uh, let's call it the last couple of months where there was talk about uh, U.S. regulators uh, talking with firms like Chainalysis and CypherTrace, like some other, you know, some, some surveillance tools to see if there was a way that they could get their head wrapped around tracing it or at least keeping account of it. But, um, but then again, that'll go against the whole point of it and what, it, what the, uh, you know, what the whole design was. So we'll see. Um, it was um, Alex, it was, uh, and Rob, it was Zcash that was uh, delisted by Coinbase UK. Zcash, yep. Yeah. So on the not list is something is actually a coin I'm not familiar with. Um, it's YFII, uh, DFI money. And this is, uh, you know, um, a rough week. I'm, what's that? In a rough week. Good guy. Yeah, I mean, when I saw the charts on this, it, it wasn't looking pretty. And I could see why uh, the group here nominated it for the not list. But, um, you know, Monty and CJ, if you guys could kind of, kind of give a backstory to uh, YFII and, um, you know, what this is all about before you jump into the charts, that'd be great. Uh, I, I know a lot of people probably aren't going to be familiar with it. Sure. Yeah. Essentially, it's just another DeFi token, really. And the reason why this one got so much attention, I think, is largely because of the price of the uh, per per coin. Um, so it was listed on the exchanges just a few weeks ago on most major exchanges like Coinbase and Voyager. And immediately on that first day, as you can see from that first green candle, it saw a massive run up to almost 10,000. And, and the volume um, on coin market cap was one of the it was one of the highest uh, price coins in the crypto space and also one of the um, most traded at that time. But since then, I mean, uh, it's just been in this sort of downward triangle. Um, and I think, I mean, it's now it's, it's even lower than what it started at. Um, I think the reason why uh, this one was so interesting to me is kind of what CJ is highlighting now is the this sort of triangle pattern that has emerged just immediately um, since the listing of this coin. And for me, this is a very bearish um, formation. Um, it's already kind of breaking down below that triangle. Um, but for me, like within, with a newly listed token like this, there isn't really much support. So this one for me could drop a long way. And yeah, I wouldn't definitely would not uh, be bullish on this right now. Is it heading the way of sushi, you think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and just like Monty makes a really good point when he talks about the descending triangle. I mean, that's been so detrimental for many crypto assets. But here we have going, you know, we have sequential going all the way down to a red nine, a short one to four candle correction of the opposite uh, nature. And then when we have a candle that is breaking the prior swing low, uh, kind of what was the inverse of what I just talked about on Monero and uh, Theta, we have a breakdown and a further confirmation of that bearish price action. So if you're short, you know, good for you. Um, but yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't buy this thing at the moment. Nope. <laughs> uh, Rob, well, what's your, what's your take on DeFi lately over the last uh, week or so? I mean, um, definitely there were some, uh, some stories that broke hearts and wrecked some people and, and kind of took the wind out of the sails. Um, but what, what's the sentiment you're gathering? Depends, depends who you talk to. You know, like, I mean, I think it's got a, it's got a great future ahead of it. It's just that it's, it's a cardboard box floating in, floating in an ocean. I mean, you, you, you can't get anywhere with that. You just can't. So it has to have major upgrades and things have to get fixed. But I will say um, all these different problems that we're having, all the, the sushis, uh, the yams and all that stuff, these things have to happen so people can realize, hey, this isn't the godsend that we thought it was. And we've got to do a lot more work to make this actually functional. So I'm happy. Yeah. I'm not going to say I'm happy to see that it's failing, but I'm happy to see that um, uh, they're fluctuating so we can make it actually better. DeFi is the future. And um, that's why I was so excited. I mean, not to go on a tangent, but so I was so excited with, uh, with Crack and getting their banking license. I can just see, I mean, major things ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure. And I thought, I thought uh, with the cardboard box analogy, you were going to say it's like a cardboard box. Eventually it's going to get soggy and you're going to sink. Um, but uh, Ryan, what are, what's the news that we should be looking at over, over the course of the next week? Um, what, what are some uh, big telltale things that are happening? I think, um, you know, given how uh, active the regulators have been, they uh, dropped the hammer on SALT uh, as well. Uh, they ruled that their ICO was a, a fraudulent uh, fundraise 
or an illegal fundraise, if not, not fraudulent, sorry. And uh, they've been taking a number of regulatory uh, enforcement actions. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to see a handful more announced next week uh, and the impact of those as well. Um, you know, uh, I think that that right now is starting to become a, a, a top line uh, news cycle, right? I mean, every yeah. day this week we had another announcement from the from the regulators about an enforcement action. It, I mean, it's definitely looking like it's uh, going to be the month of the regulators. I don't know exactly what that's about. If it's if it has anything to do with the presidential elections or if it's just something that's that's you know just happens to be uh, culminating now um one of the things uh I'll, you know one of the last things i want to get to uh with monty and cj is what's our outlook for the next uh let's call it 30 days running into the presidential elections is this an up in the air we don't know where anything's going to go or uh is it just a nothing burger for me um yeah i mean a lot of this has to do with like the ambiguity of the political election and like it's really hard to to predict i mean not only the outcome of this election but how it's going to affect the market and for me um whenever i have that sort of uncertainty i tend to trade with uh, a bearish ten a bearish um like a bearish tendency so i'm leaning a bit bearish just until the election but depending on how this election turns out we could see um, a boom after it. But yeah, um, it's, I think, I mean, all this stuff we've talked about today with the regulators and the election, I think there's just so much uncertainty right now that um, it's really an unpredictable market. I mean, everyone who thought the regulators were asleep at the wheel, uh, I think they're being proven wrong. Uh, the, the U.S. regulators are pragmatic, they're deliberate, and they don't, they don't move fast and break things. Uh, you know, they, uh, they've proven that they, they've been uh, on top of uh, the industry for quite a while because these investigations don't just happen overnight. No, for sure. They take years. They take years. Um, all right, guys. Thank you for joining us for this, uh, for this week's episode. I know uh, we ran a little longer than usual because we had just had some really, we had a bunch of really neat stuff to talk about. Um, so I thank you for uh, sticking through it. Um, I will say that we're going to, so the link for uh, the article that CJ was referring to from Market Rebellion uh, with Willie Wu, we'll have that in the description for you guys to take a look at, um, as well as, uh, you know, guys, Monty, CJ, thank you again, marketrebellion.com forward slash crypto. Uh, that product's being re released out of beta shortly, so definitely go out and take a look at that. Um, and then Rob from Digital Asset News, if you haven't been to his channel, and you probably have, uh, it, it's one of the most fantastic channels there are around. So hit him up. His All his info is in the description as well. Um, and from, you know, Best Hair in Crypto, Ryan Gorman and myself, thank you guys again. We'll see you next Friday on Trade the Chain. Later.